forget where I am. Yep. Um, I'm here with um, Paul Taylor of Taylor Made Physio in Pennant Hills, and I thought we'd have a chat about how his business has been going in the COVID-19 um, era. Hello, Paul. How are you going? Good evening, Martin. How are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. Only down the road from yeah. me, but it's very strange. You know, often I can walk by and call in and say hello. But yeah. uh, what time to finish work I tonight? I see you jogging past sometimes and wonder how you're going. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, we finished about 8 p.m. tonight. It was just one of those things where we had some late patients. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been busy to, to fitting everyone in the current, with the current restrictions and things like that. So, yeah, it's been good. Our business is going well. All right. I've got a couple of questions for you because I like to sort of see how we go. My first question for you is, when did you start noticing the impact of COVID-19 on your business and what were the signs? I suppose I was worried about COVID-19 after seeing what happened in the UK. They were sort of a week before us at one stage. Um, and Australia was tracing and following that pathway for COVID fairly closely with the UK. We were sort of a week behind. Um, and so I was wary that things were going to have to change when, uh, after looking at the UK. Um, I think we saw a change in our business when Scott Morrison went in that week and he went for a week of going to the football to gatherings of no more than 500 to no gatherings of no more than 100 to gatherings of no more than, I'm not sure, don't quote me, but he went from literally a week to going to the football to groups of no more than 10. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when the general public got the idea that this is going to be much bigger and it's not just the general flu and is going to kill people. So that was um, early, sorry to interrupt. So that was early in March, wasn't it? Yeah, that was early March. So, so what was your um, initial reaction to this and how did that evolve? It's actually quite interesting. Um, we almost closed the business at one stage oh, because wow. we saw that exponential growth. Um, and what we were looking at in New South Wales was the numbers were doubling every three days. And it got to 2,000. And I was thinking, if it gets to 4,000 in three days and then 8,000 in three more days after that, and obviously it goes on, do I want to be part of that infection? Um, obviously, I'm a physiotherapist, so I am in close contact and we have that exemption of being within one and a half metres of, of our patients. Um, but obviously, because I'm in that range, we are at risk um, not only to ourselves, but to our patients. So the question was, do I want to be part of that exponential growth? Um, if you speak to any of my staff, I was probably a bit scattered that week um, in the decision-making <laughs> that I was going through about, do we close, do we not close? And that week, I think we saw the Sunday double to the 2000 and then it dropped, thankfully. And by the Wednesday, it had plateaued a bit and I was a bit more relaxed about um, staying open. And my thought process was, as long as the numbers are plateauing, then I'm happy to stay open. But even to this day, if we saw numbers double overnight and go 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, we'd close probably. We're on a week-to-week -week analysis that we might, if numbers doubled every three days, then we'd, we'd certainly look at closing. So, when, so and, when that happened on that period, did you hmm. immediately start changing things in relation to staffing and customers and things like that? I think every physio practice did. Um, I know some physio practices have actually closed um, the week before I did, a week before it plateaued. I'm not sure if they've reopened. Um, uh, so, and what we did was we increased our infection control measures. Um, so we only have one physio in the practice at the time right now, instead of three, which we used to have, you know, three months ago. Um, one of our, some of our receptionist staff work from home, every bed, every patient gets their own linen, um, everything gets scrubbed down between patients. So we have all these extra protocols in place that to prevent the infection crossing between patients. Um, and the guidance from my staff is if you have a minor sniffle, then don't come to work. If you are sick in any way, then, then stay at home. Um, because we just can't risk being the epicenter. And I, I feel for the, um, 
for that healthcare worker who went to the nursing home, who worked in the nursing home, who describes herself just having that mild cough symptoms and she was COVID positive. And I'm sure um, mentally she's probably struggling at the moment because of the effect of that on carrying that virus. So obviously we don't want to be part of that either. So we're very strict on um, patients who come through the door with any cold symptoms, please stay at home. We'll call you on the phone. We'll, we'll teleconference you and other things like that. Um, but if you're well, please come in to the scenario. But also our older and at risk groups, we don't see anymore. I'll ring them and talk to them or teleconference with them and, and speak to them rather than them being anxious about coming into work or coming into my practice and being at risk there. So, so the knock on effect would be there'd be less people coming in through the business stores, but also just unpack the teleconference. Did you have that up and running or would you have a really rapid learning curve to get that moving? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's been a pretty rapid, <laughs> it's been a pretty busy month. Um, no, we didn't have the teleconference up and running. Um, it was, uh, thankfully there's a, um, good physio websites, um, Facebook pages where they post a lot of information, um, and quite a few suggestions. Um, the, the, there is, uh, encrypted, uh, teleconferencing systems designed for physios that we learned quickly on the run how to use amongst other things, amongst sorting out all the government grants and sorting out patients and then implementing all this other stuff. So it's actually been a really busy month, even though I've seen 30% less patients this month. 30%. Two, two more questions, if I may. Um, sure. Have you managed to keep all your staff? And, and if so, how did you actually manage to do that? Um, yeah, we've, yes, we have managed to keep all our staff actually. Um, uh, we've tried to maintain hours even as much best we can. Um, my hours have dropped significantly, which is partly a blessing and partly a curse um, of actually treating patients. Um, one of my other physios has also dropped hours because there's only one of, one of each of us in the practice at a time. Um, we decided to keep on staff because our staff are good and having to retrain staff is hard. Um, the government grant um, hopefully will make that easier um, but we're still fighting that battle and hopefully that becomes clearer in the next couple of weeks um, so, to, so so one of the things I wanted to ask you before we wrap up was about the government stimulus package um, and you know what was that been like for you yeah, that's a really interesting beast. Um, so part of the stimulus packages, uh, one was the write-off for the PAYG tax. So effectively saying that I don't have to pay the ATO the tax I take out of people's wages. Um, and I thought that was starting in March, but unfortunately I've got an ATO bill for PAYG tax today. So I'm gonna have to ring the ATO tomorrow and see what that's about. Um, Cause that was a, that's a, a couple of thousand dollar bill that I wasn't expecting. Um, uh, the $1,500 per fortnight per person has an inherent risk in the fact that you have to carry um, at least six weeks worth of um, wages for each person that you have. Um, mm -hmm. So for this initial time period, there's three two week blocks. Each of your staff will get paid uh, $1,500 per block. So it's four and a half thousand dollars per staff member. Um, and if you've got 10 staff, that's $45,000. So Gosh. for businesses that don't generate any money, they're having to either dip into their well for $45,000 or borrow that money, which of course I'll be paying interest on. Um, if say at the end of this time period, we find that we're 29% down and not 30% down, then we would have paid our staff the extra money, but we won't be eligible for the $1,500 per staff member back. So in other words, I would have paid my staff the $1,500, so $3,000 each staff member. But if we miss that 30% down or only 29% down, I won't get that money back from the government. Oh. So it's actually a, a bit of a financial risk. Um, I'm interested to not hear anything about the state government stimulus. I thought Matt Keane would be shouting that from the rooftops. Um, 
there's very little media around that. Uh, from my understanding, you have to be 70% down. How you prove that, I'm not sure. Um, and my understanding is they'll pay $10,000 towards your um, fixed costs, such as rent or uh, uh, subscriptions to software or other things. So um, how you access that or how you apply for that, I don't know, it's not relevant for me because I'm not that far down. Um, and so there's, there's big question marks about when you'll receive this money and you'll be out of pocket for large sums. And the stimulus package doesn't seem to be following through regards to the PAYG tax write-offs. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be an interesting time period. So if I could, I'd like to wrap up this section, um, if we can, uh, um, in general terms, thank you um, for your time. And you've, do you feel there's a bit of, I'm hoping there's a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for you. Um, but yeah, um, we're, yeah, we're in a really lucky position. Like we're still open. We're still generating money. Yes, we're 30% down. Um, and I count myself as exceedingly lucky. We've got, great staff and good patients and we'll survive this. Um, I have no doubt about that. Um, I feel for other businesses which have seen larger drops like your takeaways and your cafes, <clears throat> I feel for your businesses that have been closed down entirely. Um, I, I can't see how you get back from that. Um, I've, I've been extremely lucky and my landlord has decreased my rent by 50%. I'm not sure what other businesses are doing business rent, rent rents are really expensive. Um, 50%, um, that's a good knock. Yeah, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I've known, known my landlord for a number of years and he's a, he's a, he understands what the business pressures are. I've spoken to other tenants, other business owners who are paying $10,000 a month in rent and how a takeaway place generates $10,000 even this time period, I have no idea. These are penno um, shop ones? It's a pen and hills shops, yeah. Um, so, 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 let, so let, if, you, if can we just branch out out of um, from your business now into the sure. into the um, pen? How's it going in Pennant Hills? Um, I think if you ask a lot of um, businesses in Pennant Hills, they're struggling, and actually, I'm probably represent. I probably don't represent represent the normal um, business. Uh, if you speak to takeaway places, they're struggling a lot and they're staying open to lose money, um, to lose less money than they would by closing. Mm -hmm. um, you talk to the local dentists and they'll tell you they've lost 90% of their revenue over the last couple of months. Um, if you look around the shops, you'll see a number of businesses closing. Um, I, I can think of three or four which have closed in the last month. Mm -hmm. um, which was already on top of massive business closing before. We actually did an interesting thing. Remember we um, put together a survey for businesses before the COVID actually started and we collected and, and sent out surveys in that time period. And um, some of the businesses which responded to that responded reasonably positively. They said, you know, we'll make things work for a number of years and I'm sure we'll come through this and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then COVID hit. And those businesses are now gone, they've closed. Um, so I don't think many businesses, um, certain businesses, there's nothing they could do, they would fail in this, in this climate, no matter how well they were structured or what they did. So yeah, it's an unfortunate circumstance, it really is. Um, I feel for these guys, um, because they usually invested a lot of time, a lot of their own money, usually mortgage their house, usually, um, probably doing lots of sleepless nights and long hours um, just to lose money. So I, I, I count myself exceedingly lucky and um, I feel for the guys who are struggling currently. I can, I can hear that in your voice too. You've always been compassionate. You wouldn't be in the healthcare field if you weren't, didn't want to look <laughs> after people. <laughs> but, but even... <laughs> <laughs> it's you know I only live a block from Pennant Hill shops and it's it's very strange, it's very strange mm -hmm. to wander through and see crosses on the ground and 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 even just people getting their coffee. There's sort of like I tend to go after my runs or something. And there's a bit of a silence there as you walk mm -hmm. through. You know, it's very yeah. very strange. What's it like during the day? 
do you get out of there for lunch or anything or um it's probably quiet it's almost eerie um mm. people seem to um be focused on what they want to get they go and get it and leave there's no there's no that normal banter and chatter and noise that background noise that you normally expect in the in the Pennant Hill shops and um I think it's I think people who are used to that miss it um mm. uh how you get that back I've got no idea um it's going to be an interesting time well it's actually going to raise a whole lot of other issues because what this era has done, and I'm, I'm no expert in anything, to be perfectly honest, but the only thing that I can say with confidence is that everyone's had to turn on the coin really quickly and implement things that might have taken years of discernment and maybe not even be implemented, and they're just doing it in days, like you did with teleconferencing. Yeah. And again, I, I mean, we, we battle with government, we battle government grants, which are all really appreciated. I have to say that the, the, the thought process behind those um, and teleconferencing, but I can't think of what it'd be like if you're deciding which staff members to keep and which staff members to, to let go. And, um, you know, your best staff member saying to you, well, I can't live on 20 hours a week. You'll have to, I'll have to go and look for something else or, you know, even just closing with, with people who've been with you for 10, 15 years and shrugging your shoulders and saying, look, I, I've got to look after my family first. And, and to, in order to achieve that, I can't, I can't pay your wages this month. So, you know what, Paul, yeah. I saw, I, I, I'm a teacher, as you know, but my father was a mm. small business owner in Liverpool. And I remember dad would come home after and I could be working six or seven days a week, long hours like you. And mm. I always got the sense when I was a bit more understanding as a late teenager, he had a sense that he had to, he was responsible for the mortgages for his employees to a certain extent. Do you feel that sometimes mm. too? Yeah, very much so. Um, very much so. You, you, um, you realise that very quickly that if your staff are happy both at work and um, then they will... Um, be with you a for a long period of time and you'll get the best from them. Um, and they're people too. So you can't just, you, you don't have to, um, uh, uh, um, scrimp and save every cent out of every transaction to be successful in business. So you don't have to cut people's wages to the, to the bare bones for you to be successful as a business owner. And I think, um, business owners who are purely in it for the money um, struggle. I think business owners who see their collective group as a family um, and everyone has a place in that um, tend to be more successful. Maybe they not make, don't make as much money, but um, I think it's rewarding knowing that your staff are happy and content and um, can pay their bills. Let's face yeah. it, if you're worried about paying your bills and paying your mortgage and not being able to afford food, then you, you're not, you, you're not going to be happy at work either. You're always going to be looking for something else. So I think from a business owner, there's just, it's good to look after your staff, not only just for your staff, but also for your business. And I think it's much more rewarding as well. I think you can leave business. And I imagine your dad probably left business being highly regarded because he looked after his staff. And I imagine I his so, staff yeah. were quite loyal to it. Um, so yeah, hopefully I can emulate your dad and you know, be well regarded by, by my staff. But I think that's an important process. Look, it's, um, you, it's interesting. My dad passed away two years ago and one of his, he was a pharmacist and one of his 16 year old apprentice sort of shop assistants came to his funeral and, and, um, my, my apologies, she didn't come to the funeral, but she rang my mum soon afterwards, absolutely devastated. Like this is sort of. 50 years later, almost. Ooh. It was just mind boggling that you can have an impact on people just by being a decent human being and a business owner at the same time. Yeah, I, you don't have to be a pain in the bum to be a successful business owner, I don't think. Yeah. You can, you know, you can positively influence people's lives. And I still remember my first boss, he was a, he was a hard bloke and I'd never wanted to work for anyone like him again. Um, and hopefully I'm not like him. <laughs> but um so yeah i think you can be really formative as a boss and um either good or bad and um yeah so anyway 
Well, like it's, it also, it's, all, it's also the patient side. Because I remember I met you. I remember you, we were talking. I had one physio session with you probably about 10 years ago. And I was training for an Ironman races. And you've got an Ironman story as well because you never made it to the start line because of an injury down in Canberra. You can talk about that if yeah. you want to. But then I remember you said, <laughs> I remember you said to me, listen, I can't sort of sort work this out with you. Let's go for a run. So you actually met me at 7.30 after the, the business had sort of closed <laughs> for the night. About that. <laughs> and we went for a run around Pennant Hills, which is basically you said, well, you need to, I need you to run on some hills and some flats and some downhills. And that's become my cornerstone 6K run around Pennant Hills because that run we did that <laughs> night, I've been doing ever since. It's my, my standard 6K run. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness we've got a bit more high tech than that <laughs> we've got a treadmill <laughs> oh yeah well, we, we sort of did that but <laughs> we probably were talking and you just wanted to go for a bit of exercise and i wanted to sort of deal with the problem i had so yeah um yeah uh i think in a world where we're increasingly bombarded with um advertising and things like that i think um a human connection makes a nice point of difference between you and every other business and um there's quite a few businesses that do that well um yeah so it's nice to know that you remember that 10 years on it must be some busy session <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, we've got a bit more high tech than that. Oh, no, no, you had the high tech stuff on the other side, but it was just it was a good run too. I enjoyed it. You, you put me under the pump because you're younger than me. I thought, oh, geez, I'm losing form here. <laughs> I don't know I'll if you run that fast since now. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken on the bike a bit more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you want to share your Iron Man story because that was a classic. Because you wanted to do an oh. Iron Man and you couldn't do it. Yeah, um, we, that was back in the day when you had to qualify for the Ironman and you had to do a half Ironman within a certain time period. And I'm sure you remember the time and the, and the, um, the Ironman, half Ironman was in Foster at the time. And um, I went up to Foster and we'd, we'd done, all the, done all the training. Went up to Foster and I um, did a qualifying time, but I finished horribly. Like I was cramping and I was, it was pretty clear that that was my limit at that time. Um, and I hadn't drunk and I hadn't eaten very well during the, during that Ironman. So I'd struggled all the way through it. Um, so Canberra Ironman was uh, six or eight weeks later. So we signed into the Canberra Ironman, not to set a, not to set a particularly fast time, but just to get the eating and drinking right, which as you know, is important because if you don't, then you're never going to finish. Um, and I jumped into Lake Burley Griffin off the wall to start the, start the swim leg and bang my knee on something sharp and it cut through a five mil wetsuit and cut through my knee and um i thought at the time oh it just felt like a rock i'll pull my leg out and i pull my leg out and have a look at this and pull my leg out and blood spurted in the air and i thought oh maybe i should get out <laughs> maybe i should get out <laughs> yeah so i got out and um they stitched me up back at the hospital. I missed the fact that I'd ruptured my tendon in my knee, the same tendon you tap to sort of get the reflex. Yeah. And so I went back, went back to hospital. I went back to work and I was working in the hospital at the time at um, RPA and it didn't feel right by lunchtime and I was working in the orthopedic ward <clears throat> and I spoke to one of the orthopedic specialists there and he said to me, Oh, I think you've done your tendon and go and get an ultrasound. So, I went and got an ultrasound and confirmed that I ruptured my tendon. I went back and saw him in his clinic. And I said, well, when can you stitch this back together? And um, he said, it was the last time you ate. <laughs> so I, I, I checked myself into the ward I'd been working on earlier that day and had my knee operated on that night. And I remember coming out the next day and um, I said to him, oh, when do I get my brace? When, do I, when can I get up and going? And he said to me, you're not getting a brace. And I thought, goody. And I said, I don't trust you. You're getting a full leg cast. And he said, I didn't get a brace. I got a, a leg cast from hip to ankle. I said, I couldn't take off and I couldn't move because I was that patient who always do more than they should. So um, I think I said, called him a rude name. And he said, but I'm right though, aren't I? And I said, yeah, you're right. You get a full leg cast. So I had a full leg cast on for three months and I missed the Ironman. So yes, this is... Um, 
Well, you know, I did it. You know, I did it at fifty-four, and you're a lot younger than that. So you, you <laughs> and the kids are getting older. Is it still on the agenda? <laughs> I'd love to. Um, I'd love to. It's um, oh yes, the cycling's up there. The swimming, I was never good at. The running, I'm sure, we could come back. It's a selfish thing, though. The triathlon, the Ironman, isn't it? You've you've got to yeah. take a lot of time to train for it. It is as expensive. I'd like, I'd like to believe that I could get back. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think we'll have to have another conversation on this because <laughs> you helped me, got me back on the road. Well, it must have been 15 years ago, maybe. Would that be Look right? Were you, you were living at Epping at the time? Yeah. When we I first moved met out you? Of, yeah. So we, when did we move out of Epping? Um, I moved out of Epping when Ruben was one which was seven years ago and i've been in practice for 14 years now so it would have been about i think you're one of my first patients we got the treadmill oh, must have been at least 10 11 12 years ago so it must have been between the 12 and the 14 year mark i reckon <laughs> <laughs> if we were running on the street at back at that stage <laughs> <laughs> you need two treadmills now we'll have to go side by side but then you can't look oh, the crikey. back because <laughs> that's what you're doing you're making me run ahead and you're looking at my foot strike the bottom yeah. yeah yeah well oh, we just set up cameras nowadays and i dare say my style is going to be worse than yours currently <laughs> <laughs> no let me assure you there's a goal and rule to running except slowing down and walk and that way you'll still be there later on but you're the expert not me <laughs> Oh, geez, I don't know if I could prescribe to that if I was 20. <laughs> no, no. There's yeah. this thing in you when you're in your 20s, you can run really fast and hard and you get to your 30s and 40s and 50s and there's this other thing called muscle memory. And occasionally the competitive urges come out and you go for it and you can't walk for a week afterwards. <laughs> I think we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I could beat that time when I was 20. No. Yeah. What you do is you change the goalposts to say, I'm going to do a PB for 43 kilometres. Yeah. Instead of an marathon. That's, <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? Um, I think with maturity comes speed. Um, how's your running going? Are you still doing the 40Ks a month? Um, I'm on, um, I'm, I'm, for the last five years, I've been doing 100Ks um, mm. a month. Um, and then two years ago, I had the okay. most, including the wa walking up to um, about 1700 for the year I've got a log mm. for it and I've got to I've got myself to the point where I can run 6k's and I'll walk two or if I don't run 6k's because I'm feeling a little bit tired and I don't switch into fat burning quickly I then mm. sort of might then run and walk to 8k so basically three or four times a week I try and do eight kilometers an hour's exercise mm. And then I do my, as you know, my runs around Sydney. So my last big run was I ran from Manly to Watson's Bay. It was 45 kilometres and it took me eight hours and 50 minutes. It was a very hot day in February. Yeah. When's the next big one? Where's the next big I haven't one? got to the Shire yet. So I've got to go to Cronulla. And Cronulla from here is exactly 42 kilometres. But it's through the middle of Sydney. So it's lots of streets you've got to watch you know and you get a bit tired at the end but that's another story we'll worry about that later now now would be a perfect time wouldn't it with lack of traffic or through sydney and it would be but i think when you run for you know 40 odd k's like that I, i'm very conscious of the fact that i don't want to affect my immune system because the, the hospitals are struggling enough as it is so i'm actually mm. doing less if that makes sense to make sure that i'm keeping my health mm. Are you finding that in the practice that there are less and less sort of sport related injuries? Oh, stacks. We're, um, we're missing all our contact sports injuries. So winter's yeah. contact sports. So it's all rugby and soccer and netball is supposed to be semi-contact, I think. But, um, but yeah, we, we, it's our busiest time usually, our sports, our contact sports injuries. Well, so they've all been cancelled. Well, I've, I'm finding there's a lot of other injuries where people are at home and they're doing things like they never did before, like push-ups and sit-ups or using a rowing machine and then all of a sudden they've popped a cartilage in their rib and, or something like that. Actually, our biggest injury so far um, in the last month has actually been posture-related. So people working from home, yeah. not working in a good desk and position. So I'm seeing lots of upper backs and necks um, just from poor posture sitting at home. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the old dining room table with a cup of, um, with a laptop on your lap or something like that is, is, it's been a, um, the, probably the biggest um, mm. patient number come through recently. Yeah. So yeah, it's been busy. Um, yeah, so uh, the home gym exercises, there's always an interesting array of exercises on the internet that you can prescribe. I feel like sponsoring some of them and saying, after you finish this exercise, please come and see us at TaylorMade Physio <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for, for your treatment of your back or your neck or your knee or, or whatever they're prescribed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but yeah, no, so that's that's, uh, we're missing that. Yeah. Well, Zoom's only meant to be going for 40 minutes, and I think in a minute we might cut off. So, right. Wow, you've got some editing to do. <laughs> I might keep it all here. Just go back for 40 minutes on a Penadol's District website and see what happens. <laughs> I think, I think sure. we... <laughs> Please comments. Who are these two old two blokes? <laughs> oh, that's all right. We'll see what happens. Anyway, we've got nice backgrounds. It might work. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> yeah. I'll actually I'll stop the um, recording now in case we cut off. Yeah. But then um, okay, I'll stop recording.